live. There we go. Good evening, Carlene Pavlos, my partner from Massachusetts Public Health Alliance. You're on mute. <laughs> Good evening, Mary. It's great to be here with you and with everybody out there in Facebook land. It is indeed. And you know, we're here tonight because the moment is calling for uh, some new level of education. We actually have to, to our audience, we have members of the environmental health and safety team answering questions in the chat. And we also have a resource folder that we've put together. We will put the link in the chat. It has environmental health and safety materials and links to good articles that Carlene and I might be referring to tonight. But we're, real, we're at the cusp of starting a new school year. Educators are excited to be back full-time in person with our students. And in fact, we know that's what's best for our kids. But as the Delta variant, the most highly contagious variant so highly contagious variant so far, takes hold, the context changes daily. Last week, there were nine counties in Massachusetts with COVID rates high enough to follow the latest CDC guidelines on masking. I think this week there's only one that is not. That's right. Right. And today we just hit a new high of 1,400 cases in Massachusetts. Though we're still highly protected by the vaccine, there are breakthrough cases um, and vaccinated people can transmit COVID. So as educators and as leaders, we must protect our children. Those under 12 are not eligible yet for a vaccine. And those 12 and up who are eligible, those vaccination rates are still too low to stop transmission, particularly in communities of color where because of structural racism, the pandemic has hit the hardest. This afternoon, NPR reported that nearly 94,000 kids across the nation last week caught COVID. They were 15% of all the new cases last week. And that's actually a 31% increase uh, over the roughly 72,000 cases reported a week earlier. Uh, the week before, there were only 39,000 new childhood cases. So we also have to protect our educators. We have some educators that despite being vaccinated are immunocompromised or they have other risk factors and some are pregnant. Yet we know what works to make schools as safe as they can be. They're the same layer of mitigation strategy, CDC mitigation strategies that educator unions like the MTA have been leading on and winning throughout the pandemic. The five most effective strategies are ventilation to control infection, universal masking, vaccination, distancing where possible. And once again, we will continue to win those measures as we start school. So the last thing uh, that I wanna say is we cannot afford to have outbreaks of COVID in individual schools, throughout a school district, uh, or even worse, in regions across the state and have to rush to a shutdown again. But once again, the Commissioner of Education and the Baker administration are failing to take the strong positions that unions, that the Mass Public Health Alliance, that politicians are taking, and even boards of health are taking. So. We're here tonight to talk about our pub with our public health experts and community members and students about all of these topics. Carleen, give us a little bit of a background of what the state of public health is in, in the general public. Thanks, Mary. First, let me say thank you so much for having MPHA here with you because we know that Unions and labor are just a huge part of public health and our allies in public health. And so it's just great to get to do this with you. Um, you've actually laid out a lot of really important public health information in, just in the opening that you just did. And I am just imagining as people are listening to that, that we're probably all, I think I'm I'm certainly speaking for myself, feeling really differently about the state of COVID than we did maybe six weeks or even four weeks ago. And one of the things I think it's really important for us to remember is that this shouldn't really be unexpected. These kinds of ups and downs feel disappointing and frustrating, 
but they are um, in many ways not unexpected when there's a new virus that is that we're still learning about, but is also changing and mutating because there are um, because it is still circulating so prevalently um, in the in the population and particularly in some communities. So a reality from the public health perspective is that we really have to marshal all those defenses that you talked about and not just use one strategy, but all of those kinds of strategies, vaccination plus masking, plus ventilation, plus social distancing, plus continued access to testing. It's a cumulative thing, not picking and choosing in a moment, but using all the strategies that we have. I also just want to say that from a public health perspective, it would be far better if, if as we approached the return of school, we were all operating under one set of rules and that those rules were being established based on health and public health experts and not the loudest voices in the political landscape. But right now that really isn't the case. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education here in Massachusetts is not following the guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, or the American Academy of Pediatrics. Both of those call for universal masking K through 12. And instead, what is happening, what is going to happen right now is that local jurisdiction, which means local boards of health and local municipalities advised by their boards of health, are being forced to make the hard decisions because the state won't do it. This is not the, the following the science um, pledge that the administration previously gave us, and it's really making us less safe. And if I could just take a minute and hope that all of you will join me in thanking the local health officials who are doing their jobs at this moment Indeed. and making those tough calls. I think that's really important. We want to really call out that leadership at the local level um, and thank them for it, even in a context where we wish they weren't having to make those decisions by themselves. Now, I also want to say that we need to understand, we need to, all of us, understand as much as we can the science that that will help us make good decisions. And so for that, we're really lucky to have with us two experts who are going to help us understand a little bit more about the emerging science and the data, sort of the state, the, the level of the land right now here in Massachusetts um, from a health and public health perspective. So first, I want to introduce Alan Geller. Alan is a senior lecturer in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and has been really focused um, on helping us understand the picture of the data and digging more deeply into it so that we can really understand what risk there is in communities and understand some of the better strategies for addressing that risk. So, Alan, can, I hope you can join us. Coming live. Mm -hmm. There we there go. We go. Oh. Great. Uh, hey, Alan. It's great to be with everybody. Hey, um, Alan. Good to have you. Good to see you all again. And thank you very much for the uh, introductions. So, I have some slides that we can load up that I can go through fairly quickly. And while we're waiting for the, the slide, I notice a lot of comments. Really, there's there's a hundred percent. Everybody wants to be back in school in for in person, and and people are noting that in the chat. We have a comment from an educator. We can do it. Absolutely, we know how to do it. The reasons why we were able to keep COVID rates as low as they were in schools last year was because the unions won many of those mitigation strategies. So we have. We have the, the formulas that work. We do, and we know, uh, you know, masks are pretty simple and very effective um, strategies. So, so 
again, it's a cumulative strategy that we need to, or cumulative strategies used together that we need to be working towards. Right. And I see your slides are up. Great. Okay, so we'll just wait for our behind the scenes to get the slideshow started. Great, thank you. All righty. So, you know, we've learned a lot in the last year. And of course, in some ways, none of us wish that we were here with you. But if we're here with you today, we want to be here in the most informed way. And I think we've learned some really important lessons in the past year that we can translate to this year and hopefully make uh, mitigation be even stronger. So the first point, and uh, Mary and uh, Carlene were making it very well, we just really need to reiterate that masks work, not just that they work in a laboratory, but they work in the real world. I mean, to me, the heroes were children and teachers who just did a fantastic job. And if we were back in August of 2020, there probably wasn't one of us in the room who would have thought that the kids would have done so well to keep their masks on for a year. And they did it. And we know now that parents are in strong support of it. There was just an article in yesterday's Globe showing that in Massachusetts, 80% of parents in the state want a mask mandate. That's the, the popular notion. Two is that teachers rose to the top. And when I show you some data in a couple of minutes, you'll see the drop in uh, COVID rates across the state prior to the Delta variant emerging. And in large part, that's attributed to teachers and to parents stepping up and a White House report showing that 90% of US teachers were vaccinated. I can't imagine any other employee group, any other class, anywhere else where we would see 90%. If only we should have 90% everywhere else. We learned how to build partnerships. And I was shocked when Mary told me sometime during the year that she and Carlene had not known each other uh, up until this past year. So they forged a, a tremendous relationship as did uh, Marion and uh, Jody from Mascosh. So we have partnerships that have worked spectacularly well. And now we have new partners, such as the Massachusetts Association of, of, of Health Boards. And I've been really impressed with five really strong state senators and representatives. Uh, state Senators Comerford and Rausch and Representatives Dome, Decker and, and Gouvet, who've just done a terrific job filing protective health legislation for parents, teachers, and um, and students. And so they're among many in the state house who we've become close with over the past year. Next slide, please. So uh, important point that we raised in our talks last year in the webinars is that the rates among school aged children mirrored those of the rest of the community. Remember, we heard from many state leaders to say that COVID was just not something that occurred among young people. We've heard the data that Mary reported a few minutes ago about what's going on in the country. But again, anytime you see a rate in the community, you look at the rates among children and they're gonna be very, very similar. So it, it, it is common in the community. We have to learn some lessons and it's very important from a public health lesson, not just to see how things work in a laboratory, but do they work in the, in the real world? And so that old fashioned slow PCR testing, which may take a week to get some data back for people did not work. In many districts, less than half of educators and particularly parents and children complied with this. And so we need 21st century rapid antigen testing and there's a bill in the state house to promote that. Uh, next to last, we know that rates of COVID dropped in the spring, it's very important. We had two really key components, the vaccine rollout and mass compliance. We do have to remember that when schools opened up by and large, social distancing ended, kids were on top of each other, but it was masks, it was vaccine rollout that really led to that period where the rates uh, really dropped. And last and most important is that inequities were paramount both in who was infected, but also who was vaccinated. So uh, there's about 40 or 45 high risk cities in Massachusetts that got hit worse by COVID. We would have hoped that there would have been an opportunity to improve vaccination rates but again, in many of those communities among adults and among children, vaccination rates lagged far behind. So these are the things that we need to be addressing to make this be a thing of the past. Next slide, please. This is one that's hard to see, but I think I can just let you know, it's hard to imagine that 
in December or January, we were seeing 60,000 cases of COVID per week in Massachusetts. So as you look at the top part of that, this is what you see. But back in October of 2020, there were about 5,000 cases per week. And sure enough, now back in, now in, in uh, August of 2021, we're seeing 5,000 cases a week. So this is, uh, it, you know, we were down to about 400 cases a week, and now we're up to over 5,000. So this is all resulting from the Delta variant emerging, and we'll go through the next couple of slides to, to talk about that. Next slide, please. Let me just show you what, what, what some data that has just completely blown me away. Now, this is from nine cities that we would say have had high COVID rates. I believe that they're all MTA cities. And just fix your eyes on the bold onto the left. And you can just see when we're talking about a vaccine that has greater than 90% efficacy. Look at Brockton, for example, in April, having 446 cases in the last two weeks. If we look second from the right, it went down to 28 cases in those same communities just two and a half months later, showing the strength of vaccines. Unfortunately, because of COVID, excuse me, because of the Delta variant, we've seen a reemergence. But again, that reemergence has not anywhere near where it was in the beginning. So just look here and just we can sort of soak in the, the power of these numbers. We can look at Springfield, a drop from 1,068 cases over a two-week period beginning April down to 44 or 54 cases a few months later. So this is very, very impressive data. And when we talk and we go back to communities, we really need to say that these vaccines did work in your community and they're still working. But we obviously, the job before us is to increase the rate of vaccinations for adults and for children. Next slide, please. So that was for adults. And this, I, I, I wanted to see what it looked like in children. I had to make a special request to the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and was able to do it. But if we just look at Boston, for example, these are the number of cases in Boston in April among children between the ages of zero and 19. I do not have July data yet. I'm afraid that those numbers will increase. But just look here, 976 cases among children in the month of April in Boston down to 77 in the month of July. And you can see those numbers dropping precipitously. Again, this is all pre-Delta variant. Next slide, please. So here's the paradox. It's a very, very important one for us to understand. So Governor Baker will say, and sure enough, Massachusetts is the second best vaccinated state in the country. And yes, 70% of adults have been vaccinated, 61% of kids 12 to 15, and 67% of kids ages 16 to 19. But there's a catch, and it's a math game. You can get to 70% by having rates of 90% plus in prosperous towns and close to 50% in denser, higher risk cities. You put 50% of one, 50% of the other, you land on 70. But we have gaps of 40% when we look at well-to-do towns versus less well-to-do towns. And this is the inequity, this is what we have to address. And with the raging Delta variant, we need to do better. So where are the remaining 39% of 12 to 15 year olds who have not been vaccinated? Remembering 50% of communities have rates below the state average. And this is where we need to sort of come up with resourceful, creative ideas where we bring together uh, MTA, uh, um, district leaders to try and think of school-based vaccination clinics, something that we can do together. We can talk more about that. Next slide, please. So if we look at this, qu this question of where are those 39% of kids, this is for 12 to 15-year-olds. The dark blue are the uh, uh, suburban communities uh, w uh, um, west of Boston. But look at all the other spots on this map of light blue, gray, and those are areas where we have 25, 30, 35%, 40% of people vaccinated. You can see that Bristol County, you can see it in Plymouth County to the south. You can look up to the northern part of the state and you can think of Methuen, and Tewksbury, um, uh, uh, um, Lawrence, Lowell. So there's vast disparities by geography, by uh, race, by ethnicity, and it's portrayed very smartly in this map. And if we look at the data for 16 to 19 year olds, which is the next slide, we'll 
we'll see that again. And thank you very much. And again, just looking at this map, sometimes the picture says a thousand words, and you can see the dark blue in certain concentrated areas, but the light color in big, vast swaths of the state. You can go to the next slide. And my uh, next to last slide, again, this is really trying to look at the 12 to 15 year olds and the 16 to 19 year olds. I think the best way to think of this, again, is if you count up the proportion of people under 60%. And so if we look at the tan bar, we can see here approximately 47 or 48% of uh, people under the age, between the ages of 12 and 15 have not been vaccinated and quite similar numbers for older, for, uh, older children. So in the last slide, we can just say that what's very impressive is that even modest vaccination protection, so for saying in certain communities where the vaccination rate was 50% or so, that coupled most likely with some degree of natural immunity gave us, some, gave us a lot of protection among children and adults because of the fact that we had fully vaccinated teachers and because of mask use, that provided strong protection in youth and adults pre Delta variant. However, and Dr. LaRock will talk uh, about the Delta variant, in light of the Delta variant, we must be increasingly vigilant to boost vaccination rates among children and adults. 38 of the 42 high-risk cities in the state are well below the state average for young children. And as Mary mentioned in the beginning, we've hit a plateau. It's stopped. We're stuck. And we need to come up uh, tonight and going forward with big new radical ideas to get us out of the rut, to get us out of the quicksand, and to think of how we can make a big shift. Thank you very much. And Alan, one of those big new radical ideas is actually quite simple. Uh, we had proposed to Governor Baker that the firefighters who and the EMTs who are certified to give the vaccine come to the school sites to vaccinate educators. It's not too late to do that for our children. And it's not too late uh, to do that for our educators who aren't vaccinated yet. You know, as a union, we have the right to bargain. The Red for Ed movement is a movement that bargains for the common good. So instead of overwhelming our school nurses, we can bargain what conditions could be like if districts wanted to come up with an innovative project with their boards of health to get our students vaccinated on site because it removes the obstacles that their families may face mm -hmm. in trying to take unpaid time off of work to get their kids to the pediatrician. Um, we're unions, we have relationships and power. So I do think we can think out of the box. That's, That's absolutely it. right. You know, if you look at the numbers and you follow them week by week, you can see in certain districts where there may have been 512 to 15 year olds vaccinated, it was stuck. And you look the next week, there were 1,200. What has happened? The district has decided to open the doors and have vaccination clinics. Um, and you can bring in many of the parents as well. You know, lots of people say if we can vaccinate parents, that's going to have a big impact on the kids. So we can really do a, a double job by opening those school doors. Yeah, it's such an important reminder that we have to keep working on, again, on all of these different fronts, and especially in communities that have been the hardest hit, because it doesn't it doesn't make any sense that we have this mismatch between where we have seen the most infection, the most hospitalization, and the worst health outcomes, and where lowest vaccination rates are. And it's because of how um, we did and did not roll out the, um, the vaccine effort. And we have seen in those places where we've made real a real effort to center equity and to reach people overcoming the barriers to vaccination that they um, are experiencing, the vaccination rates, that gap decreases. Absolutely. And so we, we have a lot of... Um, room to make up you know there's there's a lot of space to make up yet but um but really focusing on these efforts and with creative ideas like uh in school vaccination clinics we can make a, a real difference so thank you and thank you for thank that you, of course. Right.
And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Regina LaRock. Regina is an infectious disease physician, and she's going to, as Alan mentioned, is going to be talking about the Delta variant and what that really, how that's really impacting the state of the virus. So, Regina. Wonderful. Thank you, Carlene, and thank you, Mary. It's my pleasure to be on yet another one of these public fora, and I think it's been so important as a time and place for people to talk at length about some of these complex issues that we're all facing. And so, you know, I would like to say that I'm a scientist, I'm a doctor, I'm also the mother of two children in the public schools, one of whom has a speech and language uh, disability. And so, you know, I think that an important point for all of us at this point is that the science is really quite clear, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But I think what gets complex for people is the, the values. What are the values that we are applying to understanding this science? And so I just wanna kind of state what my values are when I tell you about the science. Um, you know, my first value is that I know our children need to be in school in the fall in person and that we can't afford um, educational disruption due to outbreaks of COVID. I value their being in school. I'm a doctor, so I value human life and preventing disability, and I think that's a very important thing. I also value the precautionary principle, which tells us to proceed carefully when there is the potential for great harm. Um, and lastly, as an infectious disease doctor, I value the role of the community and the actions of a community in preventing the spread of infectious diseases. And I appreciate that there are tensions here between the individual desires and incentives and the needs of the community. And some of what we see coming um, in our public conversation is really just that tension playing out here around COVID. So what do we know about the science? Well, the science is that this is a very difficult virus. It mutates readily, especially in settings where there's a lot of transmission going on. And we have seen this happening over the course of the pandemic. So this is not a surprise, as Carlene said, that we are facing essentially a new and different virus than we faced during the previous surges. And what's different about this variant is that it is more contagious than the other ones we have seen. So on average, people are infecting between five and eight other people, which is much higher than in the previous rounds of surges we've had with the ancestral strain. It means that it is much harder to get this under control when there is community transmission going on. And we've seen that from the explosive um, nature of the epidemic in other parts of the US and around the world. So this is a different virus than we had before. And we have to deal with um, what's going on on the ground now. I know that it is a hard reality, but it is the truth. Um, we know that vaccination works, particularly the um, mRNA vaccines. Um, we need to get a lot of people vaccinated to prevent illness and death. And we've seen that these vaccines are very good. But no vaccine is 100%. These vaccines were never 100%. We do know that they are somewhat less effective against the Delta variant, but still very effective. So when there's a lot of disease in the community, we're going to see breakthrough infections. And that is what is going on. People with symptomatic disease um, who were vaccinated, um, that's a breakthrough infection. Now, we also have learned a very important feature of the Delta variant which is that it is present in very high levels in the nasopharynx of people, even who are vaccinated. That is a real game changer. The, you know, the assumption that underlied the decision a few months ago to suggest that vaccinated people could unmask was that the vaccinated population wasn't playing a big role in transmitting illness. Well, we've learned just in the last few weeks from an outbreak investigation right here in Massachusetts that vaccinated people have a lot of virus coming out of their nose. And so this is a problem when it comes to slowing down transmission in the community. This is the reality of this variant. So we're facing a real critical moment as we move into the fall and more mixing is going to be happening. We need to use the mitigation strategies that we know, the layers of mitigation that you've heard about in order to protect our school communities and our children. Um, children do get sick with COVID. Um, there have not been 
as many deaths in, as in adults, but children get sick and some get very sick and um, we need to prevent that. Um, and I just wanna be very clear that the public health consensus in the United States is very clear about what we need to do in the fall in schools. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, um, everyone is on the same page about the need for masking as one of the essential mitigation strategies in school. Uh, one key element being the need for consistency of, of what expectations are for kids. Um, and so I also want to make a last point um, uh, that um, I understand that masks are inconvenient. And in my, you know, I would prefer not to wear a mask. <laughs> um, I have a child who has um, speech issues. So I understand the concerns, but I just want to make clear that there are no medical contraindications for masks. There's no risk to one's health wearing a mask. And pediatricians across the board support masking in kids. And so that's just a really important point I want to make as well. So I appreciate the opportunity to bring these things up and I hope we'll have some more conversation about what we know and how we deal with what we know. Regina, thank you so much for that. Having that sort of the baseline about what is the reality, what's the truth about what's happening with the Delta variant. I think is really important level setting about um, vaccinated people being able to transmit and how that um, impacts our need to mask up as well as vaccine, get shots in arms is really helpful and really important to setting the stage for the entire rest of tonight. So speaking of which, I think it's, um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mary who is going to introduce our next panel. Thank you. And um, Jody Sugarman Brosen is the executive director of the Massachusetts Coalition for Occupational Health and Safety. It's called MassCosh. She's also a public school parent and she's also one of our regulars on these live streams, Jody's gonna be able to build on some of those mitigation strategies that Regina was just talking about. Jody, um, as a, uh, you, you are steeped <laughs> at the state level around pieces of legislation. We know that today Ashish Jha, the Dean of Brown University School of Public Health spoke again, actually it was earlier this week, uh, in the news about five things that we've mentioned tonight are necessary. Uh, masking, uh, ventilation, COVID testing, uh, distancing, um, and uh, uh, distancing where possible, and universal masking. Tell us from your point of view, what do we really have to continue to consider in the worksite to keep everybody safe, students, educators, and even communities. Sure, thank you. And thanks so much for having me again. And, um, you know, I, we really enjoy being part of these panels and really are so thankful for the work that MPHA and MTA has done. In this time last year, we were looking at returning to schools without a vaccination in sight. Um, and MTA and other teachers unions worked really, really hard to ensure that we were applying science and ensuring that we were doing all we can to bring students back to school safely. And, and the bargaining worked, what we did worked, and we've learned so much over the last year. And as you mentioned, we know um, how we can bring students back into schools in person in a way that is safe. And those are the five things you talked about. Um, unfortunately, um, here in Massachusetts, the administration is not listening to science. Uh, and on the contrary, the recommendations that are coming out of the state go against some of those rules. For instance, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has not mandated masks across the state in K through 12 schools as recommended by all of those who are the um, uh, CDC, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics, and in fact, continue to recommend that students who are unvaccinated can go maskless. But here's what we've learned about the Delta variants, and thank you, Dr. LaRock, for talking about that is, and this is the game changer. That is that those of us who are vaccinated can continue to spread the Delta variant 
to those who are immunocompromised or not vaccinated. And that means that we need to do all we can to be protecting those who are in that situation. And it's really, really critical that we do that. And masking is a really important piece of this. Masking, as well as the other um, mitigation strategies, ventilation and filtration continues to be a huge issue. Indoor air quality was not, um, was already an issue in our public school buildings prior to COVID. We need to be continuing to invest in those upgrades. We need to continue to see HEPA filters and the right kind of filtration in all our classrooms. But the easy step that we can be taking is to be requiring masking. And this is part of um, sort of the overall trend that the Baker administration has had throughout the pandemic to just refuse to see the workplace. And in this case, when I talk about workplaces, schools is a place where um, COVID transmission is happening and that we need to be ensuring that we are stepping in to prevent occupational exposure, whether that be in schools or in other workplaces. And in fact, even as cases are rising here in Massachusetts, even as we have new science demonstrating that we need to be ensuring that, that we can spread the, the Delta variant, even if we're vaccinated, and um, the, the Baker administration has repealed all of the worker health and safety regulations that we put in place last June. And the only mandates that are remaining here in Massachusetts are those mandated by federal like federal public health orders, like public transportation, which by the way, includes uh, school buses. So we, we will hopefully at least require masking on school buses this fall. And uh, those that are local public health have stepped up and really enforced. And I just wanna echo what Carleen has said because those, those local public health um, folks have been at the forefront of this pandemic. And as someone who works to ensure the health and safety of workers and the, really our passion is to ensure that every worker goes home to their families alive and well, local public health were the ones who were doing that during this last 18 months. Um, even with the state regulations, we know that the majority of the complaints were going to local public health and being addressed by, by local public health. And it's just so critical that we use all five of those medication strategies, but that we, we follow the science. Uh, and as a public school parent, I also feel like we and students really, and teachers sacrificed so much over the last year. We want to be back and we should be back in person. The vaccine has made that possible, but to um, not honor the sacrifice that everybody has made over the last 18 months by taking simple public health steps to protect students, teachers, and those who are most vulnerable, just are, are I, it's not something that I, I can understand at this point. Yeah, thank you. Jody, and I think that's such an important point. We, ha everybody has been through sacrifice, personal and collective sacrifice. We were in this as an entire world. And there is a lot of inconvenience this summer as we're feeling safer and healthier. I don't like, I've not ever stopped masking in indoors. I hate it, it's, it's not comfortable. But I do it because my when I mask, I protect you. Um, and I think I, you know, I want the audience to really keep that in mind. This is a shared responsibility. Um, and you know, we've got public sector, new public sector legislation that is still a struggle. Mm -hmm. Do you want to touch a little bit yeah. on that? So, as you know, there's a law here in Massachusetts that is called the Public Sector OSHA law that essentially requires that our state enforce all OSHA regulations that are in effect. Uh, and the Biden administration has put new OSHA guidance out and also created a new emergency temporary standard. And that standard is specifically for healthcare workers. And it provides another level of protection for those healthcare workers who are either in healthcare settings or in uh, embedded healthcare setting, settings like school nurses and those who are nurses in higher education and uh, other situations like that. The regulations are really clear. They provide respiratory protection, time off for vaccination. 
the state of Massachusetts should be, the Department of Labor Standards is supposed to enforce those OSHA federal regulations for all those public sector workers, and they are refusing to enforce those protections for those who work and workers in those public sector healthcare settings, including our school nurses. And it's illegal, it's irresponsible. These protections were put in place by OSHA for a reason. These are some of our most vulnerable workers and MassCosh and partners are going to be working very hard to ensure that the administration step up and do their job and enforce the regulations. We worked too hard to ensure that public sector workers got the same protection as of OSHA level protections as private sector workers to let them pick and choose which regulations they want to be enforcing. That's right. And Jody, we're very, very lucky to have partnership with MassCosh um, because it is, it's that collective struggle when we fight together, we win. And when we protect workers, be they in school settings or any other work site, we are protecting the entire community from what they may carry out of the building and from what people who go into the buildings may contract. So Jody, thanks again for your partnership and your work. I wanna bring on an MTA member now who's a professor at UMass Amherst. <clears throat> Uh, Rick Pelletier is an Associate Professor of Environmental Sciences at the University of Mass. Rick, you're also a parent of a children in the Amherst Public School, and you wrote a really, really compelling uh, editorial this week called There's No Reason Not to Wear a Mask and Still Plenty of Reasons to Wear One. We see a lot of comments from people who have the science wrong on masking. Tell us about the plenty of reasons why there are that we should be masking and can you dispel some of the myths about masks? Sure, and thanks Mary and Carlene. Glad to have you back, Carlene. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a professor of environmental health science and I'm an atmospheric scientist by training and I study air pollution. Uh, and part of that is this connection to COVID and how it transmits from person to person. Uh, and I also have a, a fair amount of experience actually researching masks themselves, both the class, the, the cloth version that many of us wear, uh, but also the N95 types uh, and others. Uh, and there is a lot of misinformation out there. There are a lot of people who uh, falsely believe that there are uh, issues of hypoxia or low blood oxygen uh, if you wear a mask, and that's simply not true. Uh, there are There is a, a, some weak evidence that suggests that uh, you can get uh, slightly lowered blood uh, oxygen, but that has no clinical meaning. It's not important. It's not relevant to you and I. I had an extra french fry dinner tonight, but that has no clinical uh, importance for my diet. Uh, and so we often have to deal with some of the noise that we see uh, in the data. Uh, but the um, the other issue that we often see in, in the research world is that masks are ineffective. They don't do their job. They don't block the particles that are floating around that you and I are exhaling. Uh, as I speak to you this evening, I am exhaling a, a volcano of droplets out towards my, my webcam. Uh, and because I'm not masked, they're being spread everywhere. Uh, it's not to say that, uh, that you're uh, it's an immediate hazard when you're in the vicinity of somebody speaking, but there's clear evidence to say that uh, when I uh, am speaking or singing uh, or even just breathing, to be honest with you, there are particles leaving my mouth. And these cloth masks that we're all familiar with uh, do a really nice job of capturing those droplets as they leave, leave your mouth or nose. And so the point is these masks work. Uh, they block particles, they reduce that transmission of droplets into the air, uh, and they all work, whether it's a cloth mask or a surgical mask, the, the paper surgical masks or N95 masks, uh, they all work. They all trap these fragments of droplets that leave our, our mouth when we're breathing. Uh, and in a community or, or in a state where we're lucky to have a pretty high vaccination rate across the state on average, we know that, as Dr. Geller pointed out, that there are, are these pockets of uh, less immunized uh, communities where you have lots of people who perhaps aren't vaccinated for any reason. Uh, and as a result, we don't really understand what the baseline infection rate is across the state. We're only seeing these breakthrough infections uh, in the mass media because of compelling reasons to test. Uh, the, the outbreak with the New York Yankees or what happened in Provincetown. Uh, these are unusual circumstances. The fact is, testing, asymptomatic testing for the most part is declining across the country. Uh, and so we don't really have a good understanding of what kinds of breakthrough infections are floating around out there, particularly in the context of something like Delta variant, uh, where we're still learning how this behaves and performs uh, to you and I. Uh, so as a result, uh, 
it's one of the challenges wearing these masks. You know, the best public health interventions that are out there are invisible. They they occur in places that are perhaps not as glamorous as you might imagine. They occur in doctors' offices when you're being vaccinated, or mobile health clinics, or uh, providing uh, nutritious food for children. These are public health initiatives that are largely invisible to the public. But when we put a mask on our face, that's the opposite of invisible. That's a very visible statement that these masks are um, uh, protecting public health. Uh, and I think there are a lot of people who are afraid of that, uh, that, that, that there's an admission of fear, that, that COVID is not quite done with us. And I think that's part of what's driving a lot of people to be anti-masking. Uh, I agree. I don't like wearing masks. They're not my favorite thing to do, but I do it anyways because I, I, I know what it can do. It can capture particles that are coming from my mouth. Uh, and I, I want to make sure that I do my part as a, a, a global citizen, uh, particularly one that has children. I have two children. I have two children who are unvaccinated, uh, and one who is. Uh, I know that those the younger children who are unvaccinated uh, are completely unprotected. Uh, they are um, drifting without any protection whatsoever uh, unless they are wearing a mask. Because one of the best strategies that we have for public health is to layer these strategies, come up with different ways. There's no one size fits all category. There's no one solution that's going to fix it. A mask alone is not gonna do it, but a mask with some social distancing and improving air quality uh, and increasing testing, all of these things layered together, work together in sync and, and maximize the likelihood that we stay safe. Uh, so my point here is that this is an effective strategy. It's inexpensive. Most of us are familiar with wearing them. Uh, I get that they're not comfortable. Uh, and I get that you sometimes feel a little awkward uh, wearing these things, uh, but they work. And if it's something that works and protects you and I, why wouldn't we make that choice? Right, thank you. That's such a, that's a comment that I really want people to, to sit with. If they work, why wouldn't we make that choice, right? This is about the common good. And I really want to encourage people to go to the article that we just posted in the chat uh, and read it. Rick, as a parent, what are your hopes for your children's experience in, in the start of school this year? Well, I come from a school district where we've already implemented a, a, a universal masking protocol. But even as a, a parent, I see some holes in that protocol. For example, uh, any outdoor activities don't require masks. Uh, athletics, still, you don't have to wear a mask. I think it's silly that we uh, we put kids in a gymnasium to play basketball uh, and they bump up against one another as they compete. Uh, that's considered safe, but sitting in a classroom uh, is not. Uh, and so what I would prefer to see is, is universal masking uh, across the entirety of the school day. I get that these things are uncomfortable, kids are fidgety, uh, but they are incredibly resilient and they can rise to that occasion. I think we were all surprised just how well most of our children were able to adapt to that. I also recognize that there are some people who can't wear masks. They, maybe they have a, a disability, for example, or maybe some kind of underlying health problem. Uh, those exceptions should be accepted. Those are, uh, are real problems and, and people can't wear them. Uh, that's not the issue here. The issue here is that there are lots of people who are electively choosing to not wear a mask and maybe they come from a family that they're not vaccinated uh, and they're gonna bring these viruses into our classrooms. And unless there's a mitigation strategy in place, it's just gonna pass around. Right, and that's the key. It's, it's layers, we've heard several times tonight, layers of mitigation strategies so we don't pass the virus around. Mm -hmm. Ventilation has to control the airborne infection. Masking is another, uh, vaccination, distancing. It's lots of layers and we can keep each other safe. Rick, thank you for joining us again. I want to end tonight with, uh, sorry, <laughs> that was my phone. <laughs> Mary, I think, Mary, I think just before we go to the next panel, I think Regina is going to jump in and say yes, one. Please do. I, I just wanted to make one comment, you know, as an infectious disease specialist, I think that there is appropriately a common question about, you know, what is the end game for us as a society with COVID? And I think that this is, it's a legitimate question. Um, and I, I think we should acknowledge that th the end game is going to be determined by how our, we behave, how our society handles this. And, you know, there are end games for many infectious diseases that include elimination or eradication. And we've done that for polio and smallpox. And that requires a prolonged concerted community effort to, to manage those, um, those real terrible plagues of our world. And so that, that could be the end game for COVID. 
Um, you know, there's other end games, some of which we're living now, which are conflagration, um, which I think is when we don't have things under control and we are at, gripped by um, out of control outbreaks and collapse of our healthcare system. And I don't think that's anything anybody wants to have repeatedly happening. And that is where the mitigation strategies are important in the short term. And it may be that at some point, decades from now, we cohabit with, with COVID. But there's a lot of suffering and death between you know, where we are now and getting to a state where we cohabit with this virus. And that's where you know, the role of trying to control community spread, prevent um, ongoing transmission is so important um, to prevent death and disability, and also to stop allowing the virus the opportunity to make these mutations that are problematic for us all. So I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, very important point too. Thank you. Thank you both, Regina and Rick. Uh, we'd like to bring our last panel on for the last segment to community voices. Vatsadi Sivangsai is a public school parent with a young child entering elementary school. And she's the executive director of the Massachusetts Education Justice Alliance. And Eileen Million is a rising senior at Emmanuel. She is an organizer in this amazing youth project called We Got Us. Uh, Vatsidi, let's start with you both first from a parent perspective. Uh, what are your concerns about your child's public school, ex first public school experience, and what are your expectations of the school? Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Vatsidi Sivang Sai, and thanks Mary and Carleen and the folks who spoke about the importance of like layering the different strategies and actions to ensure that our students and our families and educators can come back into the classroom um, safely and um, can really uh, celebrate being in school together and um, working together on uh, learning, right? Learning and, and being together. Um, you know, today I'm gonna speak from the heart of a parent with who has a rising one-year-old who's super eager to go back to school and to spend time with his friends and to meet his teachers together um, along with the PE teacher and the um, you know music teacher and all of those and being able to play in the playground with other kids his age. And then also to come from um, a perspective of a parent who's pregnant with also um, family members who are high risk. So we have all of that here in our household um, so it's really important that uh, we ensure that we're addressing really what is on the forefront of everyone's minds. Like how do we um, bring our students to school um, this fall safely and ensure their social and emotional well-being? And right now, as folks had mentioned, you know, the COVID surge is really highly contagious. And while um, the vaccines remain highly effective in preventing hospitalization and death, um, there's certainly a lot of students like my son and his friends that are under age 12 and don't have a choice to be vaccinated, um, but they want to be together and they wanna learn in school, right? So um, for us, like we really want to embrace like all of these strategies to ensure that our kids are learning together and that their social emotional well-being are at the forefront. And what we've learned um, last year, especially with the kids, is that, you know, please institute the universal mask indoors and think about like how do we um, you know be consistent with our kids, right? So if you're consistent with a young person and you're sharing with them like the reason why we're doing this to ensure the safety of our communities so that they can like run around with their friends and enjoy the time together. And so that we can end COVID together, um, you know, the kids are gonna be more open to wearing a mask because ultimately they just wanna have fun together and like learn together. And it's been quite easy for us to like start at the very beginning and share um, these concerns with them and talk to them and and then also push for like maximizing um, physical distancing indoor, 
you know, if you teach a child like, hey, stand here, you know, cons and be consistent with them that, you know, three, three feet apart, give the other person some space so that, um, you know, they can be safe. That's really consistent messaging that we want as parents to hear in school and that we can, um, you know, continue to emphasize outside of school. So practice really helps like young children. Um, the ventilation system, I've heard from a lot of parents are extremely concerned about that. So we wanna advocate to ensure that the, the, um, the ventilation and the airways are, are safe for our kids. And then having those weekly um, uh, surveillance uh, testing for the random pooling testing, as well as the symptomatic testing is gonna reassure a lot of parents um, that uh, our, our kids are, you know, that that environment is really going um, to, be, to be looked at. Um, but most importantly, like having maintenance staff and cleaning supplies, masks just in case the, the kids, you know, get their masks wet or they lose it, right? Um, that happens a lot and it really helps the kids um, ensure that they, they, they wear a mask. And then for children who um, may not be able to afford uh, extra masks that the school should be able to give that to them. But again, having a clear communication for parents and students about the local district plans, about like what, what is required um, indoors, um, what is the physical distancing, all of that expectations is really important for parents and students to know. And so that we can reinforce that and, and help each other, especially the students to learn how to take the steps, right? Um, so these are all, again, like proven measures that um, are very clear and, and parents can really feel assured that the kids are safer in school. So again, this is based on the data and the science as folks have said, it's really also based on common sense. So um, we all wanna maximize in learning in school, right? And we want to prevent spreading COVID so that our kids and our families can be together and like learn together. Um, and as a parent, that's like our ultimate um, goal is to ensure that our kids' well-being um, is at the front and center of this discussion. Um, and so, you know, I I hope that we continue to spread the message and to really look at um, some of the the false information that's going on because that really does um, scare other parents and cause a lot of confusion in our communities. So really encourage folks to um, share the message of like how we can be safe and like what schools are doing to ensure the safety of our, our children and the folks within the school building. Thanks, Vatsidia. That's such sound advice. And really, you're spot on. Uh, and when, when schools and uh, families are in communication, that's when it goes best for kids. And we have to keep in mind our kids were heroes with the protocols. Educators are experts in teaching routine and building community, and kids become the experts in implementing it. And I have high hopes and expectations for our kids for the fall. Eileen, welcome. You bring uh, both the, the experience as a college student and a community organizer in communities of color that have been most impacted. What are some of the COVID care barriers that people of color face on a daily basis? And how has We Got Us helping them overcome those barriers? Yeah, thank you so much for having me and um, echo a lot of what has been said, a lot of sage advice and um, guidelines to follow and get us all back to school. I'll also be going back to school. Um, and these are a lot of conversations that my own school and different schools in Boston have been having. Um, with We Got Us, when we started, we realized that a lot of the issues with the COVID information that was coming out of different government organizations, um, as well as from medical professionals, just weren't accessible in the way that people needed it to be, both to understand and implement it in their own lives. Um, what we were seeing were language barriers, as well as um, vernacular barriers. There was a lot of technical information that was coming out that people didn't really understand um, 
as a normal way to implement in our lives, right? I think even with the masks, as we saw at the very beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of confusion as to what the correct type of mask to wear. Um, there wasn't a lot of understanding as to why there was this six feet um, requirement and how the particles spread in the air. And I think as the world was learning, there was this second layer to making sure that information was disseminated properly to make sure that everybody could understand. Um, as the COVID vaccine came out, we saw a lot of access, info access issues with bringing it to the correct venues for um, hard hit populations that weren't really getting um, the amount of attention that they needed. Um, and same thing, language barriers that were stopping them from fully understanding what was this vaccine that was going into their body? Why did you need two different types, like different things like that? Um, and so we've been able to work with a lot of different community organizers and different neighborhoods to bring information that we curate within our organization um, with feedback that we receive from those neighborhoods to make sure that we're able to answer their questions and allow them to make informed decisions about their health. And do you see a shift after you do the education work? Absolutely. So at the very beginning, we were fully virtual. And so we held what we call empowerment sessions. And so we would have polls to gauge where the audience was at the beginning of our session and understand um, their familiarity with COVID. And as the vaccines came out, their comfortableness with getting the vaccine and its safety and efficacy. And what we saw is that at the end, we would also have a poll to gauge how that changed. And we saw pretty significant changes in um, how people felt about the, about the vaccine, the different questions that they had, how they felt that they were answered. And it was really amazing, kind of surprising as well, because some of our events were participated by healthcare professionals as well. And they said that the way that we explained it um, helped them understand and gave them tools to um, explain it to the, the people that they worked with as well. Yeah, so education really is a key. And for yourself as a student and even what you're hearing from families who have a much more clear sense, what are your expectations? What are their expectations of what schools must do to keep everybody safe? I think to echo what everybody has been saying, bringing back those mass mandates, my school actually just um, sent out an email a bit earlier. Originally, we were required to be vaccinated, but now they're bringing back mass mandates indoors um, to all students, faculty and staff. And, you know, there's um, mixed feelings <laughs> about all that, but they are saying that they're taking it on really day by day basis to understand the data that's coming in as well as reacting to that so we can have as normal of a school year as possible. And I think that's what most, most parents want as well as most students. We, we want the students in school. I have three younger brothers who have had a mix of fully home, hybrid um, and in-person schooling. And, you know, it's hard for parents to, to juggle all of that. And so if that five kind of layering helps us stay in school, like people have said, it's uncomfortable and it isn't the most fun, that's, but that's a lot better than spending another year or however much it might bring home or sick, right? And I think that's, the, we're taking preventative measures that aren't great, but arguably COVID is worse, right? So um, mask now and avoid that later. Yeah, yeah mixed feelings, but a sense of shared responsibility and protecting each other. I think yeah. those are themes that, that resonate, really. And I think one last thing to say is that we can only control what we can control, right? It's better to have as many measures as possible in schools, in a controlled environment, because when people leave, um, we don't know what's happening and we don't know if they even have the space to really um, have those measures such as distancing as well as masks. And so it's better to have as many safety measures as we can in an environment that we control rather than just trusting, right? That everybody um, can and will do, do the right thing to protect themselves, so. Yeah. I think our elected officials and all of our adults really need to listen to our youth like Eileen. They really, you're so wise. And thank you for, for bringing us your stories. We're at the end of our program. Uh, Carlene, give us a final thought and then I'll wrap us up. Great. Well, I just first want to add my thanks to our last two speakers and say, Eileen, I, um, 
the the focus that you have on doing what we need to do to keep kids and teachers in school this year is so like it, it's such the point of reference, right? That's what we should be paying attention to and um, and really calling for. And so thank you. That was such a clarion call to me and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just wanna, once again, wanna thank the Mass Teachers Association for pulling this together and for all of our speakers tonight. I have been reminded um, again about the, importance of listening to the voices of people who really know, who have who have a grasp on the science that we need to be paying attention to as it changes in real time, um, as well as who are um, the way in which Regina talked about recognizing what, what our shared values are and the places that we're speaking to. And so to be in a space where people are really focused on what it takes to be together safely, to keep our kids and teachers in-person learning um, to, the, to the greatest extent that we can and to listen to the voices of health and public health experts who have our shared, um, connected health and safety at heart is um, is something that I really value. And this has been a great, uh, another great session that really reminds us of those key points. So thank you, Mary, yeah. and all of you at um, MTA. Right, indeed, because the consequences of not doing what you just said, Carlene, you know, show up in examples like there's more than a thousand cases in Atlantic Public School students since school reopened a week ago. But as we build our communities, as we stand together united as unions and communities and public health specialists and families, uh, we're gonna continue to lead on the multi-layered mitigation strategies that we talked about all night, ventilation, universal masking, vaccination, regular COVID testing, distancing where possible. And our environmental health and safety committees are organizing safety walkthroughs to make sure our buildings are as safe as possible. There's resources on massteacher.org health and slash health and safety, including an online uh, post, protect our schools together. It's a tool for our locals to list safety concerns. They can be used by students, parents, community folk, as well as our members. So let's take up our shared responsibility to keep each other safe by getting vaccinated if you can and masking up when we enter our public schools and any other uh, public space. Be well, everybody. We'll see you soon. <laughs>